Without further ado, Mike, you can take the lead. So that's a little bit about our background. We're 
percent hashtag resistant. Um, and so what we've done a little over a year ago, about two years ago, we were testing what's now kind of the big thing about DeFi, and we were testing cross-chain um, communications protocols. And we invented a technology that uh, we decided needed to be the foundation of our, of our blockchain system, of our network. And that actually is a concept of self-sovereign identities. More than that, they are profiles, namespaces, uh, you could think of them as decentralized domains, but they're, they're more. So, so what is a Veris ID? A Veris ID on Veris, on the Veris blockchain today, is something that you can get uh, if it's not already taken. You can get it, whatever it happens to be, and it's yours. There's no rent. It's a rent-free system. You do uh, pay a fee to the blockchain for registering your identity. If you don't have a referral, the registration on the Veris blockchain is 100 Veris. If you do have a referral, it's 80 Veris. If you refer someone, you get 20 Veris uh, from that referral. And that 20 Veris extends for three referrals deep at the edges of referrals. And all of the rest, whether it's 100 that uses no referral, or 60 because it's, it's uh, 80 with one referral of 20. For the maximum referral um, of leaving 20 behind for the miners and stakers, all of the fees go directly to referrers of the network or miners and stakers. There's again, no dev fee, no company, um, no one taking rent. And once you have an ID, you have the ability to sign using the Veris desktop, you have, which actually is a multi-currency um, wallet that can support native mode Zcash, native mode Komodo, and, and, and Pirate, and other kinds of uh, systems like that, but of course native mode Veris, and, uh, and many, many other Ethereum and, and other kinds of, of currencies as well. Um, and in that uh, Veris desktop, there is a simple ability to sign using your IDs, to sign messages, files, everything else. And when you do, that's a provable signature bound to that ID, and anyone worldwide can check that to make sure that it's signed by who um, says they signed it. Um, it also, uh, Veris ID also gives you on the blockchain the ability to associate uh, data to your ID that um, we don't have an entrepreneur yet who's built the social network that would actually expose this. Did in fact at one time point in my uh, past history build a social network that uh, Microsoft bought. Um, and you know, at some point, if nobody else comes and builds a social network to take advantage of this, or multiple social networks that can just recognize these decentralized self-sovereign identity profiles um, probably will end up wanting to build something like that in a decentralized way in the community at some point. But all the technology is on mainnet. All this technology I've just described is on mainnet, has been for a little over a year, and you can use it today right free. One more thing, every Veris ID can accept uh, funds, can hold funds, and Veris IDs, although they're self-sovereign, are also revo revocable and recoverable. So what that means is, if you have a Veris ID, like um, the Veris Coin Foundation or Veris Coin Foundation, it can include spaces, it can include other character sets, etc. Um, uh, you can you can actually if you lose the keys for that Veris ID, you can define a revocation authority and a recovery authority. That would allow you to bury those uh, authorities in the ground if you want. And if you lose your keys, you can recover all your funds, you can recover your identity, you can revoke and recover. Um, on, that's again on mainnet, that's been on mainnet. Uh, we have a new technology that's coming out that's going to enhance that with um, really powerful capabilities and I'll talk about that.
So this new uh, technology is part of our Veris uh, PBAS and DeFi release. And this Veris PBAS and DeFi release has some capabilities that, you know, we've just been too busy uh, building and refining this technology for actually now uh, some years that we haven't been trying to promote, you know, the idea that we're doing it, but it's coming very, very soon. And anyone listening to this should be able to, within a few days, use this, try it out. You can actually go to Testnet now and you can try already these fractional currencies and the automated market makers, and you can launch your own currencies. Um, but with the various PBAS release that's coming uh, first to Testnet and soon to Mainnet, you will be able to launch your own blockchain that are interoperable with Veris, that are interoperable with Ethereum, out of the gate, that have DeFi built into your own blockchain that will allow you to do all of your own conversions from your currencies, the currencies on your blockchain, to other currencies, whether that's Veris or Ethereum or other DAI or, you know, basically any currency that someone might send over from Veris or from Ethereum, your blockchain can support multiple currencies, an infinite number. It can issue uh, IDs, can um, communicate with other blockchains using the Veris interchain protocol, and you can create uh, liquidity pools and DeFi currencies and basket currencies on your chain. Now, in the first release of this, it's probably going to be um, it's going to have a pretty high fee for launching a chain. You'll be able to launch currencies for lower fees. And that's not because anyone's going to be taking that money, actually. Um, half of the fees will go to miners and stakers and uh, notaries on the Veris chain, and half of the fees would go to miners and stakers and notaries on the new chain of the new project. Um, and there are no, again, no founder's fees. Um, new projects, of course, can, can specify that they would like to take uh, pre mines or founders fees or pre allocations, and there's a lot of flexibility there. But basically, Veris DeFi, which you can try today on testnet, um, and which will be upgraded to multi chain in a few days, supports very easy commands to create uh, fractional currencies, liquidity pools, and um, either 100% backed or partially backed. Uh, fractional currencies that could form the basis for projects, economies, these types of things. Um, when this goes multi-chain, you'll be able to send from Ethereum to Veris, from Veris to Ethereum. You'll be able to send from Ethereum, say, die to a Veris uh, liquidity pool and back. It's just going to have lower fees and it's going to run a lot more fairly than the normal pools people worldwide are, are familiar with. Um, you know, one of the things that we have solved as part of this work is the minor extracted value problem, the front running problem, if you're familiar with that. Um, some people refer to it as Flash Boys 2.0. I'm just gonna say that what we've done there is all of the conversions that go through a liquidity that either go through, say, if, a, if you have a liquidity pool, let's go fast. If you have a liquidity pool that is, say, 50% Veris and 50% ETH, and you send, if with that pool, you can send from Veris to the new currency to a person's destination. You can send from Veris to ETH, and you can send from ETH to Veris, and you can send in all of those directions across chains as well or transactions can come from another chain and be routed through these different currency conversions. All of the conversions of any currency are solved on a single block basis. What that means is it's not like Ethereum where you've got 
able to efficiently uh, cross all of these different transactions, even if you have a liquidity basket of, say, 10 currencies, this still applies. All of the currency transactions get the same price in and out with no spread. And because we're able to do that, you could, for example, have a liquidity pool that has, say, a million uh, dollars worth of total liquidity. And if you had a lot of smaller, tra- like a huge volume of transactions running over it, it would be quite easy to cross a billion dollars over that in a day without making the prices go all up and down because if you had a constant stream of transactions that are crossing, they all will get resolved simultaneously with our model. As far as I know, there is no other model that does this. There's not any other solution that solves front running. It's kind of an important thing. And it solves the problem of minor extracted value um, in the protocol at the protocol level. And I'm going to say one more thing related to this around miners and, and kind of uh, behaviors that we've seen emerge on the Ethereum and other, actually any blockchain that tries to do, um, you know, a completely divorced layer of financial DeFi from the core blockchain protocol that secures blockchain. When you do that, there are real issues at a fundamental protocol level, and that's what we've tried to address, not really follow a market or follow hype or anything like that. We're really just trying to build solid core technology that can carry the, you know, the, the crypto industry, do our part to help the crypto industry move forward for years to come. So, um, so one of the other problems that happens when you've got this huge economy of DeFi systems with money crossing and being converted between you know, currencies on systems that support multi-currencies like the new Verus system will. Um, one of the challenges you have is that if you've got, and, and VitaLink uh, talked about this actually year, some years ago, and they just, it was kind of part of the EIP 1559 um, improvement, fee improvement, uh, you know, EIP, the protocol improvement. Um, but I don't think it really solved the problem. And the reason is this. If you've got miners who could make more in fees than the normal block reward on a particular block because it's, say, got millions of dollars crossing and all these fees are coming out, and the miner, you know, people are trying to front run, so they're paying more fees, and, and the fees are going through the roof as we're seeing to happen, you know, and this is all kind of, or, this is all part of the same problem, actually. Correct protocols. And so, uh, or, or in case, like uh, inadequate protocols. And so um, when you see, when you're a miner and you've got lots of power and you see that a block's possible that is going to generate huge fees way above what you'll get in the next block or the block after that, then instead of trying to converge the blockchain, miners have a perverse incentive to fight for the block. And so even after that block is made by a miner, it might be worth it for miners to try and reorg the chain. Now, the whole principle of blockchain security is based on this concept that it's in everyone's interest to converge the chain, to move the chain forward. You know, it's all part of the core protocol that kind of initially launched this whole industry. And, uh, and, and so VTOL recognized this problem, pointed it out. The EIP 1559, as I said, it doesn't really address the problem. It just kind of makes it so that hopefully miners don't end up in the situation of having enough incentive to make this decision. So what we believe is different a little bit. That is that blockchain is an economy. And it's not a problem that miners can make more money 
generating probably significantly more than the block rewards. And that's just the way it should be. And it finally is a solution to being able to have a blockchain economy and not worry about all of these perverse incentives. So anyways, a little diatribe about that. Um, we already saw that basically with public blockchains as a service, when you get an ID, a Veris ID, in addition to being able to have a signature and all of these things, um, I should mention Veris IDs are also multi-sig and transferable. You can buy them, you can sell them. Um, companies could use them because they're multi-sig. You can have revocation, you can have recovery, you can have multiple levels of revocation and recovery. Um, so there's really a lot of flexibility, but you also use the identity system to define currency. You need one to define currency. You use the identity system to define blockchains. And actually, even an external blockchain, say like Ethereum, that you might want to bridge to Veris and then bridge to all the other currencies that are bridged to Veris, similar to Cosmos, but with lots more capabilities, um, you can do that with an ID. You need an ID so that blockchain can recognize kind of this root of the namespace of, okay, there's blockchain, you know, there's a gateway to the external chain that's using the Veris Energy Protocol, um, it's in, okay? And so when you launch a blockchain, it isn't side chain, it isn't chain, it isn't, it's really just a fully powerful, you know, independent, capable chain that can issue its own IDs, that can create its own liquidity pools, and it doesn't pay anybody to do that. It has its own mining, it has its own stake, and it can be merge mined as all PMAS chains can, with various and other PMAS chains using the same hash. Um, so, what that means is, you launch the best chain for your project, you can launch two currencies at once. So you can launch the PBAS chain, and we also have an option that in the commands, it's really just a command, it's not like you have to make a bunch of code to do this. And you can launch a DeFi uh, bridge at the same time. Because one of the challenges that we haven't really seen solved yet before this, is that when you want to make transactions that cross chains, you also have to, um, you have to pay the fee in the receiving chain's currency. And unless you're going to have some middleman, some pool of fees that people put in, or maybe a liquidity pool at the boundary that doesn't charge an arm and a leg to convert, you know, a few thousand sats of a currency, um, you don't really have a way to make things happen on the other chain. So what we've done is when you launch a PBAS chain, you actually can launch it with a DeFi liquidity pool that can include your, your new PBAS currency, Veris, and other currencies if you want, and it can have other launch options as well. And the moment your chain launches, transactions that go in and out of your chain have their fees converted to your native currency through that DeFi bridge. So all of that is actually something you'll be able to play with and try out with it. Um, so the other thing that we've done, so you know, because we've been working on this probably longer than, uh, let, me, let me just see. Because we've been working on this probably longer than most other projects and just not making a bunch of noise or hype about it, um, you know, we had a lot of time to think of uh, the kinds of things you'd really need. So if you look at, for example, the Cosmos uh, inner blockchain uh, communications protocol, you'll see that, you know, they're aggregating uh, transactions and they're kind of creating channels between chains and things like that. Yeah, that's correct. That's how you should do it. And that is, in fact, um, you know, one of the uh, many capabilities that we include that you don't really need to 
use an SDK to take advantage of. Um, and you can use an SDK to bridge to external chains or you know, you can just be part of the way that that works by, by using PBAS technology. Um, so we also defined this uh, model that we call the Veris Data Exchange uh, Format, VDXF. And what this does is it allows anyone with an ID to effectively define an unlimited, you know, infinitely sized namespace of public data types and names and things like that that they can publish and that can be used with this protocol in a way that that enables um, interchange between applications. You know, it's generally our belief that the real challenge isn't how do you write code and, and run it in a VM, although we'll allow you to send your your various currencies over to Ethereum and use all the VM code you want. Um, the real challenge actually is how do you get all these systems to talk to each other and how do you deal with this cryptographic data challenge? And this model is not something that anybody really, it's, it's basically something we're publishing, it's something that works, it's something we're using and we welcome everyone in the industry to use and we'll be happy to um, help you know, work on standards, but our focus is not to, you know, we're, we're a completely 100% open worldwide community project. We're just interested in making solutions that work for the world rather than spending money to be parts of, you know, uh, big corporate uh, standardization efforts that will require lots of resources before you even figure out how to solve a problem. We're happy, we do make sure, like our, our decentralized ID technology can absolutely interoperate with, um, you know, the, the decentralized ID standards that are emerging, but our goal was not to build it based on those things. Our goal was, you know, people need to be able to have friendly names. Actually, the only blockchain I'm aware of with friendly names and zero knowledge proofs. Uh, so you can have a friendly, you can, you can actually send uh, a message or money to someone at you know their name at colon private and it's going to go right to their zero knowledge proof um, address and you can send messages we just released a mobile wallet to do that um, and and it goes through an ID lookup go right to the zero knowledge um, endpoint and uh, although our current mobile release that we just released a few days ago that supports the uh, friendly name, zero knowledge proof messages and addresses and all that. Um, although it currently only supports Veris, you know, it will be able to support Zcash and Pirate and other uh, coins that use, um, you know, compatible zero knowledge technologies as, as parents. So uh, that's kind of an overview and I probably talked a lot right now and I know that um, there probably are or questions pending um, and since you know I'm not really a presenter as much as someone who spends most of their time in code I think what I'd like to do is just uh, you know first ask if that is generally a reasonable overview that was helpful and then uh, assuming hopefully that it is then I would just like to open it up and take some questions uh, and just you know off the cuff, try to answer people's questions about things. All right, one second. All right, so please, if you have any questions, please step on up, take the mic, ask your questions. So at least Mike can hear what you're doing. Get <laughs> a little back feed, Mike. Sorry about that. But uh, do we have any questions in the crowd currently? What's your question? Right. So the question was, uh, where are we pulling from liquidity pools for, for the price feeds for the liquidity pool? Did you hear that mic or no? Say that one more time so I can say it in here. 
No, no, he's, he's still up already. He might not be able to hear me because I gotta get to the, down to the phone here. So where is the price feed? Where are the price feeds for the liquidity pool coming from? Mike, you're muted. Mike, you're muted. There you go. I have to mute myself. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that's a little bit of a fundamental question about just the general concept of liquidity pools, because in, in that sense, most of the liquidity pool technologies work similarly. So um, the, the, the liquidity pool itself actually determines the price, and if the price is incorrect, then it's just an arbitrage opportunity. So as I said, the um, the if you had for example, and let's go back to the um, presentation here. I'm going to go back. Uh, okay, so it, so if you have a currency, say that is 50% uh, Veris and 50% ETH, then by definition, however much Veris it has in the currency liquidity pool is exactly equivalent value to however much ETH it has in the liquidity. This is the simplest case, okay? What that means is that's the price. Because you can get ETH for that price and you can get Maris for that price. And if that price is lower or higher in either direction, because it's, remember there's no spread, but if it's lower or higher in either direction than any other market, then you can make money arbitraging between those as you correct price. So there's actually humans, there's like the whole world is the, is the price feed. And if the price is off, then, you know, if I don't correct it and you don't correct it, someone else is going to come along and correct it because correcting it makes money. And so uh, there's not a special provision. In fact, some of the biggest multi-million dollar hacks on Ethereum came from people thinking that they need to have price feeds external price feeds and the fact that you really can't like you can only get external estimates price is the price you can move things around and try to manage to price feeds and you can adjust percentages this is kind of the new you know what people are trying to do in uh you know in adjusting the pools percentages and things like that but bottom line is that in any case you do something like that, it always assumes you're a smaller market than the other markets. And, and what we actually think is that, you know, this is this is going to cover the world. A lot of projects may use this as their only market. So that's their price. And, you know, when they have two markets, whether it's on two different blockchains that have DeFi or um, other, you know, systems, uh, they'll be able to have arbitrage. So they're really... The question of how do you get a price feed requires a little bit of kind of diving into how do uh, automated market makers work, how do liquidity pools work, because price feed is a natural part of the use of these systems. And the money-making arbitrage opportunities, and I'll mention another thing that actually is unique to Veris related to this. The money-making arbitrage opportunities that this type of system presents are what drive both the natural uh, growth and usage for systems that are used at all. Prices end up being accurate, and it always ends up being an opportunity to arbitrage and make money. Um, well, I should say, if it's, if it's used so much, and people across the world are just sending their money through it, and, and that the price is the price, then there is no need for arbitrage. But often, and in most cases, there will be a, an opportunity for arbitrage, and that will keep the price where it should be. Um, and uh, one thing to mention, I did, I did mention because we can't dive into the code really in this talk. I'd be happy to, but we can't. Um, we did uh, talk about about the fact that there's no front running, and that all of the transactions in, that go into a um, block, all 
at the same price in all directions. But there is one provision in the protocol that was intended. It's, it's, it's there for the specific reason to prevent a minor from really having an opportunity to even reorder transactions, exclude transactions for the next block, and believe that they can uh, gain some advantage that way. And what it is, is it's the ability for another miner, a miner who's importing a set of transactions to solve in a block. Uh, that miner has one opportunity to add a single transaction to the mix. They don't get to be in front. They don't get to be in behind. And they don't get to sandwich anybody. But what they can do is they can say, if that, if all of those conversions are imbalanced, then they can help to balance that and make money on that arbitrage. And so it creates a unique arbitrage opportunity. And, and I, you know, this may or may not, I should say, this may or may not be in the final mainnet protocol in this release, but it's in, it's in this, it's in the protocol now, and uh, I'm expecting it to make it to mainnet. Um, and if it, whether or not it does, it will be there shortly. And what this will allow is basically miners and stakers will, they won't get to take value from users, but they will get to have an extra edge in arbitrage opportunities that are actually just helping the network because we can tell the difference. So long answer, uh, the question was kind of open-ended because that really kind of strikes at the heart of how automated market makers really work. That was awesome. Thank you very much, Mike. Any other questions in the crowd? Uh, you had mentioned about, um... hi, Mike. You had mentioned about PBAS. I was wondering how, if you could um, further expand on how that helps with decentralization in the blockchain. I think she was asking about how PBAS can yeah. help ex it would, uh, decentralize. decentralize the entire blockchain. Stop muting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could you but could you repeat the question because I can't really hear. Okay. Uh, say what you're doing. Um, how PBAS helps with the decentralization of the blockchain. What she's asking is how PBAS can help decentralization. I mean, a sense is going to be because I think I'm not going to be able to hear the original question because it's kind of cutting in and out from the microphone. I think. So what she was asking is how can PBAS through a virus chain help decentralization as a whole? great question because okay so this is the thing that's really interesting once you wrap your head around so what is like how are people managing blockchain bridges and multi-chain systems today they're using special nodes they're using um you know they're using lots of different solutions that typically involve some deep centralization at the boundaries, okay? What this does, what PMAS does, is it enables anyone to launch their own blockchain with all of the capabilities and all of the bandwidth unused of Veris or in the future of another PMAS chain. And when they do, they can merge mine. So now all of a sudden, one hash covers two chains, or three chains, or four chains, up to 22 chains, actually, dynamically. Um, they can uh, have their own project completely independent from Veris or any other system. They have their own blockchain. The, all the people interested in that blockchain can mine and stake that blockchain. The people who are interested in mining and staking the bridge between Barris and that chain can do it. 
Other people could decide they want to mine 15 chains at the same time because they love the idea of earning from that. The people who start a PBAS chain can mine their chain while they mine in state Ferris as well. So it basically just, and, and not only that, all of these capabilities that extend to PBAS chains, including using IDs across chains, using, you know, sending currencies across chains, using the DeFi capabilities of one chain from another, but having a system that allows you to customize and create your own uh, business, your own applications for your own system, but still part of a broader network of systems. When you think of this as a fractal, like unlimited scale blockchain network, 65,000 transactions a day done by me, I mean, uh, per second, sorry, done by Visa doesn't sound like a very big number because you could really have an unlimited number of blockchains worldwide. You could have a country running elections on decentralized blockchains as in the vision paper with this model, just the same as the vision paper we wrote almost, you know, almost three years ago. Um, you could have countries that run blockchains for every precinct that do voting and the voters can actually secure the chains themselves. It really can work that way with this new release. So how does it help decentralization? Maybe by making it possible to actually have an unlimited scale, decentralized, completely decentralized network made of fully independent, fully interoperable blockchains with DeFi at the core protocol level that solves kind of the known problems we were aware of at the time. That will be my try. I'm okay with follow-up questions. Is that the follow-up question? All right, we do have we do have a follow-up. One moment. <laughs> so this is all. Come on in. Come on in. <laughs> so this is all done with CPU power. Um, but does Ferris have any plans to uh, uh, make GPU efficient? Oh, okay. Well, we, 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 GPUs are as efficient as they can be. Our algorithm explicitly does not try to make GPUs efficient, and here's why. You know, so we came out with a CPU, the fastest hash algorithm on CPUs with a CPU focused to, in order to kind of, you know, add more decentralization to the next, so it's really the reason. And what happened is, you know, we had people come to the community and build GPU miners, and they became very competitive with CPUs, with our older algorithm. And then, some company decided to start doing secret FPGA mining, and uh, we found out. And, you know, I have a little bit of background in assembly language and in CPUs at the low level in operating systems, and so, we decided, you know, probably best, I mean, of course, people will do stuff like that, so let's go talk to them, because we pretty much were confident that we were able to make CPUs uh, competitive with FPGAs, and maybe there'd be an opportunity to do that, you know, in cooperation. So we went to talk to them, and they really felt, since I guess it hadn't been done before, that, you know, they had no reason to really cooperate. So we just did it, and so we just made a new algorithm, cut off the FPGAs, made FPGAs, um, you know, similar level in performance as CPUs, uh, but the casualty in, the, in doing that is GPUs because GPUs are like weaker FPGAs, you know, they, they just, they, they're, or FPGAs are like, you know, programmable smaller GPUs. You know, so if you can make a, G, if a GPU, which doesn't have a lot of specialized instructions, but does have a lot of raw power, and do well on an algorithm, pretty much, unless it's, you know, a self-modifying algorithm that updates itself constantly and all of that, um, an FPGA is going to be able to blow it away. So uh, we have no goal whatsoever. It's not, go GPUs are not a goal. GPUs are just a, a way that people mine today and they spend money on it because everybody was using them. But CPUs 
right now, they beat GPUs not because we don't have algorithms implemented on GPUs, they just aren't as fast at what we're doing. And so uh, the reason that they're not as fast is that the goal was to equalize FPGAs and CPUs, and GPUs just kind of got squeezed between them. That's all. And so there's not really a goal of trying to move away from CPUs. The moving to enable, G, like to kind of, I would use the term nerf the algorithm so that GPUs can perform well, but really just hurt CPUs, and we don't want to do that. Does that make sense? Yes, it does, Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody else have anything else they would like to talk about? Uh, come on up. No, so it's, uh, this is uh, Poly Crypto Blog from Komodo. He's got a few questions for you.
Um, but we haven't had to change the algorithm in some time, and we don't really see a reason to change it right now. If a company comes along and does ASICs, actual ASICs, not FPGAs, then I think we're probably going to want to change it. But if we do those kind of changes right now, then it would basically it would eliminate FPGAs being even able to compete with CPUs. That's a little bit about our algorithm. We've got, there is Haraka, but there's a lot more to it. And Haraka is just a part of the algorithm that ensures that we remain, you know, provably strong as a hash. And, you know, still the post-quantum candidate level of strength. But there's a lot of technology in that relates specifically to performance and equalizing with FPGAs and CPUs. And in fact, it does actually quite well because the ARM CPUs, it does well on a rock pie because the ARM CPUs actually have the technologies that we leverage in CPUs. So it's really kind of nice. Anyways, that's the answer there. Well, thank you. Uh, so it, I have two more questions. One, it relates to stuff too, but they're related to CPUs. Like the prevalence of like IoT botnets um, is that something you guys are uh, concerned about, especially when, uh, uh, regarding uh, decentralization. Um, there's like some uh, in the past, like FireEye that had like six million, you know, compromised devices, tracking and such that could really just pop on in line. Um, would the L really be able to kind of? You just mentioned that it could be tweaked. Um, so could it be tweaked enough that it um, prevents these uh, small, smaller CPUs from actually, you know, mining? Or is this, you know, is it not really a concern? Or, yeah, uh, what's your thoughts? Uh, <laughs> you're muted again. So, yeah, I understand. Two things about that. Um, so, first of all, I, I don't actually think it's a big concern at all. I'll explain why in a minute. If we thought it was, yes, we could modify the algorithm quite easily because it's kind of designed to be able to do that. Um, but I don't really think it's a big concern for a couple of reasons. First, what we've done in the algorithm is we're leveraging the extremely highly integrated cryptographic instructions in CPUs, which are effectively ASICs in CPUs. And the more expensive CPUs always are much better at those things. And so it is true that you could have botnets, large, you know, ARM-based botnets, but the lower-priced CPUs, even in ARM, they're not going to be very competitive. And so you're going to need a lot, a lot, a lot to compete with. You know, people are mining with large CPUs, lots of CPUs worldwide. People are mining with FPGAs, you know, I get reports over there's an FPGA hash rate channel you can compare what people are reporting. Um, most people are mining with CPUs, there are people mining with ARMs, I know there are even some people mining with phones. Um, here's the thing, number one, it isn't going to be the best return, but it's likely not going to be they're taking a lot of money from the network, number one. Number two, the algorithm itself, the Verus proof of power algorithm, it's not susceptible to 51% hash attacks. So it's not a security concern. If we have a bunch of IoT, you know, bots getting a little bit of hash power out of the network and doing that, because we have the proof of power algorithm with 50% proof of stake and uh, we actually have the Komodo Depower notarization, and we'll have the new, um, the new Veris PBAS notarization. So there's not really a security concern. And even when we had the secret FPGA miners, no one was ever able to like actually do a 51% attack on the chain. All right, hold on so, one second. Hold on one second. Hold on. You have an interjection question. Uh, so uh, yeah, 51% attack. I I. Is going to 
to be proof of stake or proof of work. Uh, okay. Okay, I get it now. Uh, yeah, sorry. Thanks for that answer. That. And one last one uh, is uh, regarding uh, you know, the Schwitz guys are all building the IDs and the, the AMM and all that, which is amazing. Um, just a uh, you know, personal question why did you choose to build on UTXO chain with crypto conditions as opposed to like a Hey, smiles! That's a great question. So, <laughs> um, okay, so here's the thing. So we started with Komodo. And we forked Komodo with a, in a friendly fork, and we had a lot of help uh, in learning about the system, which you know was was very very helpful. We had a lot of help overall, just as a community member from Jail Seven Seven Seven. And I'm not saying we chose for that reason, because that isn't the reason we chose. It's because if you look at what we're doing, you can't do these kinds of low-level DeFi protocols using a VM. It isn't the problem right now in my mind in DeFi is that, you know, somebody created a really nice idea around, yeah, like the, the application model in the current industry in my mind is incorrect. It's applied incorrectly. And it's showing up now. Like we didn't really have in the industry, we didn't really have applications and expose what's wrong with it until, you know, DeFi came along. And the challenge is that, you know, you say, all right, what is, what secures the Bitcoin blockchain? Let's just go back to Satoshi and the Bitcoin blockchain and this. What was the big thing, you know? It was the fact that you've got currency that defines the thing that people are all working towards to secure the network that runs that currency, right? So now you enter someone who looks at that and says, and I, and I actually have immense respect for Vitalik. I think that he's a genius, but he was 19 and he didn't have a lot of experience in big systems when he did this. And, you know, and everybody just followed, and that's just, you know, now they're kind of, I, I'm not, that's, that's just reality. There aren't a lot of people who are going to come in and, and explain, no, that's actually not the way to do something, and fundamentally it should be, and, and so what I believe is this, challenge comes in and the model breaks when you say Ethereum is the currency that actually all the miners are working towards using to secure the blockchain. But the economy running on the Ethereum blockchain has its own incentives for ordering up transactions, for, you know, blocking or, or front running or, you know, fighting over fees or doing all these things. And none of those incentives have anything to do with securing the blockchain. And best case is, they're just going to be lucky and they're going to be secure because the blockchain was already secured strongly enough. And that's kind of what it's been. The worst case is those incentives are completely at odds with the blockchain security. And you have a problem. And so not acknowledging the hell blockchain that is actually running many, 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 many currencies I'm not in any way acknowledging those currencies at its lowest level blockchain protocol that interfaces with the miners and rewards of security on that chain and the fee model. In my mind, that's broken. And so with the UTXO model, it allows us to take the protocol, the protocol level programming that I believe needs to have multi-currency. I believe that it needs to have DeFi, because otherwise, if you don't have DeFi at this level of the protocol, you're not going to have a hope of converting fees. Because if the fees are 20,000 sats or 10,000 sats, and you've got to pay, you know, Uniswap and Ethereum fees to convert those, you'll never do it. But it cannot be solved. So we literally have the ability to do <laughs> micro-conversions as just part of the mining protocol. So that fees get paid in the native currency, which is the currency that secures the blockchain. And you know, two years ago, um, we had a model where we actually allowed the native currency to be a fraction
digital currency so you could uh, the native currency could actually be a liquidity pool itself and we decided that's just not correct it's we analyzed it and we decided that that is also broken because the native currency needs to have some limited access because that is what secures the chain and now that we have this ability to solve at a block level at the protocol level we can do something like all of the transactions that get solved in a block at the same price in all directions with no spread now once we can do that all of a sudden it can be very efficient because you know what this isn't where you want to have every different programmer who came to learn solidity or to learn you know some other script language writing your multi-million dollar financial math and launching their contracts you know let's have the world working at the lowest level of the protocol let's get it all right there Let's let everybody just use that protocol and then build all their value on top of that. But now we've made value. And there's actually a company archetype of value, which most people in the community know. It's a company in the community um, planning to release a version of the uh, mobile wallet that will allow you to connect to your, the fiat backends in like 145 countries. And, um, you know, and I have to say, I mean, they've got a, they've got a perfect name. That, you know, because in a way, this isn't just the internet of blockchains. It's the internet, and, and, and when currency, when you can send a, say, die from Ethereum, and you can send it over to Varus, and it can just convert on the way to Varus, and, I, and, and it can be received by someone else who isn't even you, and you can do that as easily as you can send from one address to another, because that is actually how easy it is. Once you can do that, then what is it that you're actually sending? Are you sending DAI? Are you sending Varus? You're sending Valley. And so I really like that they got the name Valley, even though, you know, they're, they're community members, so that's great. Um, every community member would want to be successful. And I think it really ends up being like the internet of value and the currency, whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum or anything. Actually, in the long run, what everyone's going to care most about is its value, not the specific currency, because there will be many cryptos that will be capable of doing different things, but there won't be that many cryptos that will be capable of giving you a revocable, recoverable identity that allows you to create currencies, then a programmable, publishable namespace and APIs and your own blockchain and your own DeFi and everything else without really having to program. So, um, UTXO blockchain was really a decision to make these capabilities work at the protocol level, not follow everybody into the serialized minor extracted value, you know, front running world of divorced via from a blockchain. And I'm sorry, I'm not trying to denigrate Ethereum. I think it's an amazing achievement, and it's obviously an amazing economy. And I, uh, like I said, I have utmost respect for Vitaly, and you know he had the forethought to do that at that time. And you know I was, I was in technology, and I didn't. So there you go. Yeah. So Mike, we have uh, we have one more question from the crowd, and then if you could do a closing statement, and uh, that would be fantastic. Sounds good. Hey Mike, so I just learned about Varus this week, and one of the things that really excites me about Varus is um, its ability to protect your medical information in the future. So I was wondering if you could uh, talk more about the privacy and security feature of Varus. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you for that question because. Uh, I didn't really go into that at all. Um, okay, so as we've already mentioned, Varus includes ZK snarks, Z addresses, you can combine those with identities so you can have a friendly name, private address, um, but it does a lot more than that and you've touched on another aspect of privacy, which is super important. You know, uh, 
um, privacy isn't just a private transaction. Uh, as you just pointed out, if I've got a medical record and I use kind of the existing model of medical record privacy, some centralized entity is going to be responsible for protecting and divulging parts of my medical record. So, Veris has a technology that we don't really talk about much because it's kind of like one of those, you know, geeky low-level technologies that it gives us a lot of power, but most people don't know what it is. It's called, uh, in Veris we have this data structure that goes all the way from the very small up to the very big. It's called a Merkle Mountain. The whole Veris network, in a way, all the way down to a transaction on the Veris network, can be seen as a giant fractal of nested Merkle mountain ranges. Okay? Because, and this allows us to do some really powerful things that I'm actually not aware of any other blockchain doing. I'll give an example. So, a private transaction, a Z transaction, that uses the sapling you know, technology, which was kind of the latest change of the of the Zcash uh, protocol, um, which was you know defining the uh, zero knowledge proofs. Those transaction inputs and outputs they're pretty big. They're bigger than smart transactions, which we have, um, which are our own kind of uh, intelligent. UTXOs that allow us to do this, this capability. Those transactions, you could have a lot of ins and outs of Z transactions on one transaction. And when you start thinking that you want to do cross-chain communications, all of the UTXO, well, um, most of the UTXO uh, blockchains, and I think actually, uh, Zcash, about six months after we did our Merkle Mountain Range work, Zcash rolled out a Merkle Mountain Range um, in Zcash, and I looked at it, and I believe you can get some partial sampling-related data from it, but it's not kind of the same. So what we do, every transaction in Veris, yes, it has a normal transaction ID, but it also has a Merkle Mountain Range root that allows partial proofs across the chain. What that means is that we can just drop all the big stuff out of a transaction and we can prove a single output, which is really powerful, which allows us to be way more efficient across chain than any other system I'm aware of, actually. And that same technology, this Merkle Mountain Range technology, here's how it works. You can think of a Merkle Mountain Range as a collection of items, and if you're familiar with Merkle trees, you almost can just not care about what a Merkle Mountain Range is. You can pretend for the purpose of this discussion that it's a Merkle tree. Because for the purpose of this discussion, all you really need to know is that it's got a number of different elements in it. Now let's say what could those be in the context of your question. They might be your name. They might be your first name, they might be your last name, they might be your age, they might be your COVID vaccination status, they might be your uh, different aspects of your health record, they might be the root of a health record that has its own Merkle Mountain range underneath. Okay. But whatever they are, these define a set of data, and each individual item in that set of data can be proven without disclosing any of the others. So what that means is, if an, a testing entity like a hospital, like a government agency, like a notary of some kind trusted by a certain group, or like a group of people in a community that decided they want their community to, by majority rule, decide things are true. You know, whatever the policy is, if, if you have an attestation, which is basically just some identity or multiple identities that can be posted on the blockchain or not, 
can be actually stored in a in a encrypted zero knowledge proof message that is on the blockchain but only disclosed by you when you want to this attestation this signature can be on the root of the Merkle Mountain range that represents your entire health record or it can be a part of it or it can be a collection of different parts of it then it's on the root as well but the signer says I validate everything in that collection and they must see it before they validate it only the signer the so only the testing body the hospital that did that part of your health record the whoever it is okay the data is yours and so when you want to release any part of that and you can choose the part of the data that you want to release you can show the attestation of the root proof you can provide a proof that 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 is in that collection that means that it was attested to just as everything else was in that collection but you don't have to disclose any other thing in that collection and that is something i also haven't seen in any other system and that kind of privacy is what we want to enable for the world thank you mike that was that was absolutely succinct uh, do, you, do you have any closing statements go right ahead and make your piece you know i, I just want to thank uh everyone for taking the time to listen and, and learn a little bit about Varus and we're just going to go back to work and I do recommend that you keep an eye like join the discord keep an eye on you will be able to try all of the things that we've talked every single one of them in a matter of days just keep an eye out there will be an announce um you know the test net will be available worldwide Anyone who gets the wallet will be able to load and try out the test net and send between currencies and make liquidity pools and make IDs and you go to the Discord and there will be plenty of people there who will just send out test coins to anybody who wants to play with it. And, uh, and if you've got a project that could really benefit from this, we've talked about some of the launch capabilities, but there are really so many from taking, you know, you can fund things by taking uh, price neutral issuance that basically comes out of the reserve ratio so that um, you can do that and you know fund foundations fund community projects um, there's voting capable on these blockchains now um, you know there's you can launch currencies and take carve outs from the participation uh, there's really so many options and it's actually quite easy that if you're interested, you know, you can go to the test net now, you can try all of the DeFi and ID things, including, I didn't talk about the lockable ID, but you can learn about that. It's basically virtually theft proof. I say virtually because I should probably say virtually, but if you said it ended up right, I don't see how someone can steal funds from it, even if you lose your keys. Um, so I think, you know, thanks for taking the time and uh, thanks for everybody, you know, uh, Maze and the community for helping bring this together, Santos for helping make this happen, and Michael and Michael Tude Jr. and Asher and, and, uh, and everybody else involved in, in, you know, getting just enough information together because all I do mostly these days until this is out and everybody can use it, is I'm just sitting with my head down in code. So, thanks. That's all. Thank you very much, Mike. That was amazing. Everybody, round of applause.